Friday. Well, I'm going to start today with a question. I'd like to, I'd like to get you involved. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We want to be involved. Yeah, so sure. the question is, what is the answer for the situation in the world today? Jesus is the answer. Jesus, Jesus is the answer. To, that's good. When <laughs> my kids were small, every, every night we would read the Bible, and then before the kids could get away from the table, I would ask them a Bible question. Question from anywhere in the Bible. And before they left the table, they had to answer. So my youngest son always used to answer, Jesus, <laughs> he's the answer for everything. <laughs> what else? How do they get love. Jesus? Love. Love. Love? Yeah. What kind of love? The only people who truly have love, my mother was a, a saint, but she wasn't saved till two years before she died. She loved people, but she didn't have love like we have. The Christian love. We get it because we get the love from the Father. A Father's love. And I, I've been watching the news about things that are happening. A couple of oil companies moved out of Calgary. Moved to the States because of the situation because they couldn't find an answer. But we have the answer for them. We have something that nobody else has. We have the true love. See, most people love for what they can get. They love because, because you love me. So they're returning it. Or they love because it's popular. When I first went to Kenya, you talk to almost anyone about the Lord, and they're ready to listen. Because it was popular in Kenya at that time. There were very few saved people, but it was popular to talk about the Lord because the president of the country professed to be a Christian. Okay? So that affected everyone in the country. You could talk to a, a Muslim about Jesus. No problem. Okay. Things started to change, especially after that president was gone. And uh, after that president uh, got rid of his wife, <laughs> And found out, we all found out that he was not a good man, you see. But Christians are the ones that have the true love. The love of God in us. And that's the answer for the world. Remember last week I told you the Garden of Eden, God meant for it to grow and grow. I used to be an overseer of some churches in Kenya. And all of my pastors, once a man, month I'd meet with them. And I had them fill out a paper on how many people had been added to the kingdom. Not just to the church, but were actually saved. And if they went by, two weeks in a row, or two months in a row, with zero, with, with zero, I give them a talking to. Because we are supposed to be spreading the gospel. 
That, that has been a hunger since I was first saved. Since that first night, I had to tell people about Jesus. Because I believed what I had was so good, they couldn't live without it. But you see, before that, I told you, I used to stutter. I couldn't tell anybody about anything before that. But after that, he filled me with his love. And one time, when we were preparing for the mission field, we were traveling from city to city. We went across Canada, many of the states, speaking in churches. And this one time we got to North Vancouver, and these people were keeping us in their house. And what they did in their basement, they put up some cots. And our children were <laughs> sleeping there, my wife and I. And we had gone for supper at the pastor's house. And I'm deathly allergic to sunflower seeds. And they had sunflower seeds in their salad. My daughter ran over to me and said, don't eat the salad. But it was too late. And we got home and we were, I was laying on the bed. My throat was seized up, but my head was throbbing. And uh, I was praying. I said, God, I'm tired. We have been traveling then for about six months, preaching in a different place every night of the week. I said, I'm tired, and this allergy, I said, I need you to show me your love. I'm just tired. Opening up my understanding to his love. After about three hours, I had no more allergy. I had to finally say, stop, Lord, I can't take anymore. Because you, you get so much in you. I think I told you last week, you start splitting at the seams, and it has to pour out. You have to give it to someone else before you can take any more in. So, the answer for the world is Jesus, but it's a love flowing through us, telling them about Jesus. That's, that's what makes them listen. And I was looking at what was Jesus teaching? All of his teaching. What was he actually saying? What was, uh, I heard someone say, what, what's the guts of his message? What's at the middle of his message? In the Beatitudes, everybody know what the Beatitudes are? In the Sermon on the Mount, it's part of that. But great sermon. What was he saying? When he taught, I am the resurrection and the life. When he says, anyone who believes in me shall not perish, but have eternal life. When you get right down to it, what was he telling us? Any ideas? I, I believe it, it was glimpses of heaven. Okay. How, 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 or his position in heaven, like what is he actually uh, in heaven? Like he was obviously Jesus on earth, but he was the word of God in heaven. 
So when he said, I am the resurrection and life, that he was giving them glimpses of heaven. Okay. Of who he was in heaven or who he is in heaven. Yeah, that's good. Anyone else? God so loved the world that he gave his only born and begotten son. Uh-huh. So is that what he was teaching? Well, I think he who believes in me shall have his life. Yeah. But at the center of, of us having eternal, everlasting life, what was he teaching us? The kingdom of God is the kingdom of God is within us to the Jesus to live out of Jesus. Like, okay, <laughs> you're getting very close. Yeah, I don't know how to say it. But you're I, getting I, to I it. I go back to that God so loved the world that he so loved. Uh-huh. I guess to me, that's what God so loved. The world that he gave his only begotten yeah. son, mm -hmm. that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. But what, what does that mean? Okay. I, I'm the kind of guy, when I read something in the scripture, I ask questions, what does that mean? You see? So I asked the Lord, now what am I supposed to get out of this? So when I ask myself, in all of Jesus' teaching, what was he trying to say? What was he trying to get to the world? A high level of living. High level of living, you're getting very close. No pain. Okay. Jesus is the only mediator between us and the Father. Yeah. But that's so narrow. The, the secret of how to live a kingdom life on earth the way it is in heaven. That's very close. Damn. What what he was teaching was the kingdom of God. Amen. In everything he was teaching the kingdom. But I think Eternal was, life is a kingdom. Okay, what do you I think he was putting himself as the way uh -huh. of life uh -huh. on earth as it is in heaven. So Yeah, keep going. So I think if we were able to live like he lived, the kingdom of God would have been clearly demonstrated here on earth. I, I, I think that's what he was trying to crack. You see, us. you're getting very close into what he was trying to teach. He was trying to tell us, because remember the scripture I gave you at the beginning, for God, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. He's trying to tell us through all of these mess messages, his kingdom can come. We can receive it. Okay? That, that scripture that Albert read downstairs, I, I've really asked questions and wondered about what does it mean, the mind of Christ? Because a friend of mine sent me this thing this last summer about having the mind of Christ. Mm. Now, I started studying that. <laughs> studying what? What does it mean to have the mind of Christ? Christ? What do you think it means? If somebody were to tell you, like we were told downstairs, the mind of Christ, what would you think I should do in my life? Love and selflessness. Yeah. Kingdom thinking in everything that we do here. Kingdom thinking. You see, the, having the mind of Christ isn't that I can do what Christ did. Having the mind of Christ is that I'll think the way Christ thought. Okay. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? They had little <laughs> bracelets about that. 
That's what it means. To have our mind changed. Remember, John and Jesus preached, repent, yeah. change your mind. Kingdom of God is at hand. Because the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus said, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom. You can't even see the kingdom. People in the world cannot see the kingdom. And then he said, unless you were born of water and the spirit, you cannot enter. Okay. So now he's talking about entering into the kingdom. To even see it, you have to be born again. But you have to be born of water and the Spirit to enter. Okay? So all of his teaching, this is the center of what he was teaching. The kingdom. He had a kingdom. People want to make him the king on earth. Remember that? He said, this isn't, that's not my kingdom. Yeah. I come for a different kingdom. Okay. When we can enter into the kingdom, then we can start showing other people. That's when we can start loving people. When the people in the world can see us loving them, there was a man who was a drunkard out in Kenya. I used to pick him up on the road, he was so drunk. He'd pass out on the road. And I'd pick him up and drive him home. Did that for several years. I was pastoring a church when I first went there. And he used to come into the church and he'd mock. He'd start yelling as soon as he came in the church. Some people would chase him out. I said, come. I invite him right up to the front and sit down. But finally, I went to see Actually, I went to see his son. His son became a chief. And his son was as big a drunkard as him. And I went to talk to the son one day. Because I talked to the father many times. And I went to talk to the son. And the son was gone. It was early in the morning, but as a chief, you had to leave and do things. So the father was there. He said, you can visit with me. I said, have I ever told you how much God loves you? And he just started weeping. I preached to him, but I was handing him the kingdom, and he started to weep. And he fell down on his knees. And he said, no, tell me. And he accepted Jesus. He quit drinking. Start going to church for real. Yeah, you say you have to be born again before you see the kingdom of God. Uh-huh. And then you have to be baptized before you enter. Be born of the spirit, spirit and water, yeah? Yeah, can that be? Okay. Um, when I was in Uganda, I was traveling with a pastor one time. And I said, what church is this one? He said, oh, that's a, that's a board and game church. We went a little further. I said, what is this one? He said, oh, that's a Protestant church. And we, we were traveling about 30 kilometers. And every church, he'd, 
He named what it was. There was Catholic, Protestant, or born again. Born again means you have accepted Christ. Okay. You become new creations. But as far as I can see from the scripture, to be born of the water and the spirit is being baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, things like that happen in different order sometimes. Okay? Remember, Cornelius was filled with the Spirit before he was baptized. I was filled with the Spirit before I was baptized. I didn't know what it was. Okay. After I accepted the Lord that night, I couldn't, I couldn't speak English. And I, I was scared to speak around people because I thought, well, what is this? And then when I got baptized, it was a church that used to really pray for you when you got baptized till you got filled. And I said, because they were really sweating and praying, <laughs> shaking me and everything else. I said, what are you expecting? They said, well, we believe that when you're filled with the Spirit, you'll speak in tongues. I said, what's that? So they told me, I said, I said, now I know what it is. I've been doing it. Oh, wow. You understand? But I didn't know what it was. So you're born again. But some people just accept the Lord. Then they go no further. Okay. I believe these things happen very close together. Okay. But what about all those Christians who, like my family, my sister, my mom, my dad, they are all just Jesus lovers in the biggest way. And they have been, they accepted Christ. And just what I'm hearing, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm hearing that we're not, you're not going to enter the kingdom if you're not actually filled with the Spirit. Because are you not filled with the here, Spirit? Here, just, not accepting Christ? just a second. I believe, like it says in Acts chapter 2, repent and be baptized and you shall be filled. Okay. I think there's a lot of people in the church and a lot of denominations that have the Spirit and don't know that. Okay. So I'm not saying those people aren't filled with the Spirit. They just don't demonstrate it. Like, there, there's a question come from one of the courses I taught last year. I believe today that much of the church is dead. Okay? They are not demonstrating the working of the Spirit. Okay? So they might be filled, but they're not demonstrating it. It's like, it's like having a Christmas present. Pretty soon Christmas is coming. Does anybody give gifts at Christmas? Can you imagine getting a gift and not opening it? That's what a lot of Christians do. I, I used to minister a lot in the Lutheran church in Tanzania. Because quite a few of their people came to our Bible school. When they came to the Bible school, they, they definitely got working in the Holy Spirit. But, so they didn't fight me down. And their leader, who when I went to visit the church and speak to the church, I used to have to go through all the, anybody been to a Lutheran church? They have a lot of this liturgy. And I had to wait with him and walk into the church with him 
and we had to bow down at the front and say a little prayer. And then. But as soon as I started preaching, I knew this man was filled with the Holy Spirit. But he couldn't talk about it in his church. But I'm telling you, there were more miracles happening in that church than in some of the churches calling themselves Pentecostal. Okay? So, so what I'm saying is, I believe once that you've repented, that's a problem that many people don't do when they get saved. Okay? Many people get saved because they come to an altar call and they repeat after me these words. I used to do that. When I first went to Kenya, that was a method I'd learned. And this one guy came into church one day and he actually ran to the front of the church and he was weeping, he was down on his knees he was weeping so bad, his tears, and his nose was running. There was a puddle on the floor of the church. And so I said, repeat after me. I led him in a prayer. That was the last time I ever did that. Because he got up and left the church. Never, ever went to church again. He thought he was okay now. He went out and did all the things he used to do. Never changed a bit. Because he wasn't repenting, I was repenting, and he was repeating my prayer. You understand? So after that, it took me a while to, it dawned on me, but after that, I asked, you pray. You talk to the Father. He's waiting for you to talk to him. Because that's what happened to me. Nobody led me in a prayer. The Holy Spirit just kicked me out in the middle of the floor and I prayed. He was showing me what to pray. So I believe if you truly, truly have repented, and you're baptized, you shall be filled. There, there's nothing can stop it. But now you have to operate in it. Remember, I, I'm doing a Bible study in our church on the book of Romans. But remember in Romans, there's a passage that says, there is now therefore no condemnation you remember that one? Yeah. To those who are in Christ. To those who are in Christ. To those who are in Christ Jesus. Huh? To those who are No, no, I heard that, but and what else does it say? Somebody look it up. Yeah. Romans 8 1. Oh, according to the Huh? Somebody read it. <laughs> there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Aha! See, many people forget that part of it. They, they like to say, there's no condemnation. I'm not guilty anymore. But I walk after the flesh. I do what I want. Yeah. You see? And there is condemnation for you. The word says, they've condemned themselves. You see? But if I walk after the Spirit, if I say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. If I do that, and I'm led by that, 
then there's no condemnation. You understand? It, it's the same as my favorite verse. This one was prophesied to me. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. His righteousness yeah. And all these things will be added. Most people read it, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be yeah. given to you. <laughs> the righteousness. They miss the righteousness. And many people read Romans 8 1 and miss the righteousness. You see what Jesus was teaching and what he taught his followers was there's a kingdom for us. But we have to walk in it. Jesus could say if you've seen me you've seen the Father. How many of us can say that? How many of us can say, if you see me and how I live, that's how the Father lives. That's how it is in heaven. When we can show his kingdom here on earth, that's when people's lives are going to be changed. We had an evangelism course in our school. And I had another teacher teaching it because I'm not really an evangelist. But when I look back, I probably led thousands of people to Christ. But I'm not an evangelist. So I had another guy teaching it. Then I watched this one evangelist in South Africa. I don't know if you've heard of Rodney Howard Brown. He, he's a South African who came to America and started the Laughing Revival some years ago. But he had gone back to South Africa to do a little crusade. And he had a very simple method of evangelizing. He went there for one week, ended up 50 days. Bars were being closed. Hospital people were getting up and walking out healed. One little girl gave a testimony. She went into her school and in some places in Africa, when, when school is starting, they have a big assembly every day. And she asked the head teacher, can I speak at the assembly? Everybody in the school got saved. So I thought, rather than teaching all this theory, we're going to do something different this year. So we had 22 students in that class. So divide them up two by two and send them out. In one month, 1,500 people gave their lives to Jesus. But you know what happened? Some of the people they led to the Lord, they said, what church are you from? They said, we're not representing any church. We're just representing Jesus. They said, because if you are from that church down there, we don't want to join. Because that church the pastor was sleeping with every second lady in the community. So they got saved because they said, we're representing Jesus. But they said, we don't want to join this church or this church because there were reasons. And that's the same thing. 
I've often wondered when I lead people to the Lord, should I leave someone there to start a new church? Remember, Paul says, Paul says, I don't build on another man's foundation. There, there's a lot of shaky foundations that need to be shaken, need to be changed. We need to see people praying for the kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. And it's possible. It's possible. Because the Jesus I know wouldn't teach something and tell us to do something if it wouldn't have effect. <clears throat> okay. I told you last week about him telling the disciples at one time in Matthew 16, 28. There are some of you here that will not taste of death until they see me coming in my kingdom. But all of those people died. Hey? In terrible ways. In terrible ways. So was Jesus lying to them? No. Or was he talking about, you see, when he died and rose again, where was he seated? Right on the cross. We heard that downstairs tonight. He is the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. And he has called us to be kings and priest. <coughs> so some of those disciples that were there, they understood what he said. And I believe they changed their way of living. They started seeing how Jesus was living and started living like that rather than the way I used to. We can get very religious sometimes and miss what Jesus was really teaching us. What was he really getting at? He started, John the Baptist started, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He was saying, it's close to you. It's close. He wasn't the king yet. Remember, all that happened till Jesus died on the cross was Old Testament. Okay? You understand? The new covenant is in his blood. So all of that was Old Testament times. But once he died on the cross, once he shed his blood, the new covenant came into effect. And that's the new kingdom. That that's how we're going to see the kingdom grow and expand. Because there are people today in fine buildings who are building their own kingdom. Yeah. Not God's kingdom. But remember, he says in Revelation. The kingdoms of the world have now become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. These things can happen now. Okay. Break time. You don't need a break? I don't need a break. You want to break this? The red square. Yeah. Yeah. I've got